Hello. Hello. Uh, I assume that my tablet is still not going to work to share a screen, but just in case, I'm going to sign in with it. Uh, just in case. Um, I'm just getting a couple things ready in my room, but in a minute, you could just uh, make me a co-host and I could share the screen. Okay. No, no, I, 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 my, there's some, I, I can, I'm fine. I just, I prefer to share the screen on my, on my tablet. And for some reason, uh, it, it doesn't allow me to do this when I'm only when I'm working at this thing. So it's some I, setting, I but. I changed the setting to say multiple partners can share, share simultaneously. Great. Let me see if that. That not make any difference, but. But for some reason, I don't, the idea of sharing. Maybe if I just try share document. I'm just give me one second while I mess with this a little bit. Um, you know what? I'm just going to use my. I'm get, I'm just going to use the the to do it the way I've done it in the past with this group, and it'll be fine, and we won't worry about it. That's really no reason to worry. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so hello. Hello. <laughs> it's um, it's 12.03. Should we wait two minutes and see if more people sure, come? Or? A couple people are coming in. So okay. I I, I'm I'm curious. My father's a member, and he says he didn't get a um, he didn't get a an announcement. Uh, I sent one out. Well, I got someone out last week. Oh, um, okay. I should have probably sent one out uh, as a reminder, which I did. No, if it went so out last amazing. week, then that's. But um, that's... The, part part of the problem is that because it's on the standards of calendar been encouraging the front office to put it in the weekly newsletter, but that hasn't been happening. So that's uh -huh. that. So I apologize for any confusion. Mm -hmm. no but unless you hear differently, it's the third week <laughs> of the month. Right. It's through June. All right. So we got Let's get started when I like, which I don't know, Steve's in a nice place. Um, I'm liking his background. Is he in a hammock? Indeed, my kids got me a hammock for the back deck because they oh, know nice. I love hammocks. That's lovely. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were in a hammock or a canoe. Exactly. <laughs> that, was, that was what I was wondering. Well, it's a pretty good bet. It's going to be one of the two of those. Yes. My ki uh, kayak that yeah, you may beautiful. well remember. Or on my bike. Wow, oh, I'm so happy. I figured out a way to share the screen the way I like to. Excellent. I just saw it show up. Okay, we got somebody else coming. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, this is great. Now, I, well, I, I like to do it this way because I can yeah. write on it. And sure. Makes yeah, perfect I know. Thank you. There we are. Uh, oh, wow. But I do have to just learn the, the new plan here. Hmm, maybe not because now it's uh, this. Okay. Okay. So we'll get started. Nice to see you all. And uh, let's see. How, how, raise your hand if you were here the last session. Bob and 
Michael and Nishama and everybody except for Steve. Okay, great. Welcome back. <laughs> um, I may have, I'm not certain. <laughs> okay, so this uh, this week, our portion of the week is um, is a double portion. Uh, Tazria Metzora, and we are deep in the bowels of Leviticus. And it's really been fun for me to open up Levit. I'm so glad that I said that I was going to do Midrash every week because really I haven't studied in depth the chapters on these two portions in Leviticus Rabbah. Um, in, and so going through that in order and seeing what the concerns of the rabbis are has been really quite fun. Um, so this this double portion, they're both quite short. They it, it's made up of four chapters, um, and they're all about the central theme of Leviticus, which is how to keep the camp of the Israelites in a state of holiness that allows for God's presence not to be repelled by various kinds of impurity. So the chapter 12 is on childbirth and its purity related ramifications. Chapter 13 is, um, is about a disease, introducing a disease called tsara'at, um, and how you recognize this disease on skin, on clothing, and on house walls. And this word sara'at is, has sometimes been translated as leprosy, but pretty much everybody agrees that, including the ancient rabbis, that it's actually not leprosy. Um, it's, um, it's some kind of a corruption of the membrane between self and world that is has moral implications um so this disease is called sara'at and um then and those are the two chapters that are in portion tazria and then in chapter in portion mitsora there's two more chapters chapter 14 is about how to cleanse a mitsora which is somebody who has contracted sara'at and then 15 is the purity related ramifications of the emission of various bodily fluids. So you can imagine how thrilled all the bar and bat mitzvah students are whose parents chose to organize their bar mitzvah date around the weather rather than their Torah portion. They're just thrilled, thrilled. Um, <laughs> and it can be challenging to work with them. But so um, all of these things require the attention of the priest and the efficacy of temple sacrifice and temple-based ritual in order to, um, to manage the impurities right, around these, these issues. And as we discussed last time, when it comes to the laws of Leviticus, there's a central goal that we find in the rabbinic interpretations, and that is to uncover some sort of relevance in, in the face of the non-existence of the very thing that these directly address, namely the role of the priests in the temple. Um, and in the case of Tzara'at, they, um, so I'm gonna actually talk about these in the opposite order. I'm going to talk about Sarat briefly, and then I want to actually delve into one of the Midrashim on portion, um, on the first portion, Tazria. So in the case of Sarat, this this disease that you need a um that you need a priest and a whole sacrificial system in order to to, to manage. They distance that concept from any sort of purely um, physical cause. And so, so Tzara'at, in the view of the rabbis, is the result of, and they, they list this, the possible causes. And basically, the category is it's antisocial behavior that induces this disease. 
murder, perjury, forbidden sexual relations, arrogance, arrogance, get skin disease from arrogance, um, theft, envy, and Lashon Hara, which in the broadest sense is talking about other people. Okay, so these are all things that are antisocial in the sense that they tend to break down the integrity of the community and they cause rifts that are often impossible to heal. And so the rabbis zero in on those and especially they zero in on talking about other people as the primary and most common and most destructive cause of the disease Sara'at. And they, they, they ostensibly, um, they ostensibly base this on a pun. So the pun is this. Okay, so here's the, here's the, um, the first line of Parshat Metzora, right? Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Zot tihye torat ha This shall be the law of the mitzorah, the Torah of the mitzorah, on the day of his becoming repurified. Um, and what that so a whole bunch of the of the subsections of Leviticus Rabbah chapter sixteen, which is on this topic um end like this it says um why don't i ask somebody to read just the english and then i'll look into the hebrew with you so uh michael would you would you read the um this shall be the torah of the masora the one who has contracted sarat <clears throat> the torah of the masora shem ra the one who brings forth a bad name okay so it, the, I guess this really isn't so. So what they are saying is Zot Tihia Torat Hamitzora. This shall be the Torah of the Mitzora, of this of this Mitzora, the one who has contracted Mitzora. And what they're saying is when it says Torat Hamitzora, the Torah of the Mitzora. Read that as Torat Ha Motsi Shem Ra. I mean, this is just a, a, an unabashed changing of the meaning of the of, of, of the Torah text. And what it means is Motsi, as in Ha Motsi Lechem Min Haaretz, the one who brings out bread from the earth. So this is the one who brings out a shame ra, a bad name. So what what does mitzo ra really mean? It means someone who motzis, who brings out a bad name. And okay, so the 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 um the the to the Torah text just you know, shortened it, right? So, um, yeah, so that's ostensibly how they get this idea that what causes tzara'at is, um, is gossip. And, you know, you may have heard that, and the first time, few times you hear it, it sounds like, okay, that's kind of almost a little silly. But as you realize that what they're trying to do is work with these texts in a way that brings them into the realm of social reality that they live in. And, you know, I, when they say, well, it's because ha ra and ha motzi shame ra are really the same word, I know they don't really think that. And I wonder if they're also thinking about other issues. So, for example, 
There's the story of Miriam in Numbers 12, where she and Aaron are speaking about Moses, and she ends up with a, with Sarat on, and and Moses begs that she. That's where the the what we have uh, the prayer Anna Elna Rafana La. God, please heal her. Moses asks that she be healed, and he's the butt of her gossip in the rabbi's reading. So, you know, so that story where she ends up with a skin disease and she and Aaron are also speaking um, speaking uh, about Moses behind his back. So that might be one of the things they're thinking of. And, um, you know, perhaps there's other motivations, like in their experience, nothing has the potential to break up community in irreparable ways, like gossip or rumors or fake news or conspiracy theories, right? Uh, yeah, Bob. I, I was just thinking about this as you were talking, and you know, I I uh, have to admit that you know when I when I look at the um, um, you know, the people in the uh, Talmud and Mishnah who are doing this, that, um, you know, they're cleverly taking words that they don't like that are in the Torah and reinterpreting them in a different way. And, you know, I, I get two feelings about it. It's very clever. Um, I get the feeling that it's also hypocritical, but it struck me that what they're doing is not uh, different than what uh, reconstructing Judaism does, which is to take verses and um, respect them, but find a, a meaning in them that is um, uh, prudent and um, uh, consonant with our, our moral values. That is, I, I could not agree more. I think that, personally, I think that uh, Reconstructionism is the most traditional of the branches of Judaism for just this reason. There's an honest and committed struggle to actually using these texts and these received traditions as a lens for helping us figure out and, and express what's important to us now. And so if they have to play a game like this, right, it's a pun. And they aren't pretending it's not, right? They know that's a pun. They know that's a, you know, so what are they, so what are they saying? You know, in our, in my life, in our lives, what is it that actually, you know, break, I actually, this is something I learned from a, from a bar mitzvah student I was teaching 20 years ago. He said, well, you know, the, it's on the skin. And when you, and, 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 and these diseases are, they're like, the the inside of you coming out in a, in a gross way on your skin and he said that's like gossip in the sense that you're breaking the boundary between the inner and the outer and making um and making something disgusting come out that really should not and and that idea that the skin is the boundary and you have to respect boundaries you know the rabbis are playing with all these ideas and and i i i really you know i hold i hear both of the things you're saying bob but i really think that if you read these things on their own terms they're they are looking for ways to learn important moral lessons and run a good society because they believe that's what Torah is really about. And um, yeah, and so it's true. Trying to undo a rumor is like trying to gather up the feathers from a ripped open down pillow and you really need a miraculous cure, you know? And so when your country gets torn apart by fake news and conspiracy theories, it's really hard to figure out how to how to rein that in, right? Steve, I'm sorry, I'm babbling you instead of calling on you. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Uh, I embrace all that. I, um, I'm just wondering if in any of these writings of 
of the interpreters of the rabbis, etc. They explicit anybody explicitly says, you know, here's how this really relates to our lives today, and it really, you know, it, it, in, in an explicit way says the law was not really no. is not really what we believe. No, and that's the a deep form of respect and a form that I think we can learn from. It's not either or, right? I mean, I think that's a great question, right? Did they see themselves as upending things? Well, I shouldn't say no. The answer is yes. There are all kinds of hints all over the place where rabbis say, don't read this, rather read this, right? <laughs> and so there's definitely hints that they know that they're doing that they're doing this sometimes sometimes but they they really don't want to say and i don't know that we need to say either it was ridiculous in the olden days but here's a way to make it to save it from that ridiculousness right they don't do that and that's part of their respect i think uh it's it's an interesting question and we should keep our eye out for that i think as we as we study these things um there was you know in the the cure right the cure for the mitzorah for the person who it has tzara'at involves um a, being isolated outside the camp for a period of time. And it's possible, one, one contemporary commentator was suggesting that this is a measure for measure. This supports the rabbi's view about that it's a disruption to the fabric of society um, that is the problem here. Um, and it, that there's a kind of measure for measure going on here that the person who contracts tzara'at is isolated outside the camp and feels the very kind of isolation that the butt of gossip is likely to feel, that it's a breaking up and that sort of experiencing life alone without community is part of the cure for this disease. So um, that's just carrying it to another level. Any other comments on this topic? Because I'm about to break the rules. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. So I have to just bring this up as somebody who has um, fairly chronic eczema that and, a, and, and family members with um, psoriasis. It's, do we have a chicken or the egg kind of thing here? Yeah. So there mm -hmm. is, first of all, when you're, when it's on your, you know, I, I went through a period where it was on my face. There's a certain embarrassment and shame already. Yeah. And there, I, there have actually been some articles which helped me calm down about reactions that I have to some members of my family about how people with psoriasis can be, can be very crabby. It is a painful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Way to live, have to live. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there, you're thinking there can that, be, that makes you into an antisocial person. It can, can make you very cranky. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, well, that, that's, um, that's really interesting. I certainly didn't think of that. Where I thought you were gonna go was also another really important place, which is the last thing you wanna do is stigmatize people with skin problems and say, oh, you must be a gossiper or a destroyer of the well, yes. of community in some yeah. way. That's so like, oh my gosh. That, that, was, that, was, the, that was part A of what I was saying. Yeah. Part B, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the most extreme level, uh, there was a cousin where, you know, I, I suppose there was interaction with, I'm, it, he was suicidal. I mean, you know, interaction with other mental health issues. Right. So it's right. And and not that somebody you want to isolate presentable in your society, you know, is is incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. I always have to stick up for the person with yeah. skin issues. <laughs> yes, thank you. I really, I really am glad that you mentioned that because I think, you know, one of the, um, well, I'm going to let Bob speak. Maybe he's going to say what I was thinking. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, well, I don't know about that. The, the, um, uh, you know, a parallel thought that came to me about this, um, uh, again, not specific, the specifics of the instructions, but the implications of it, which is that uh, rehabilitation is possible. Yes, that absolutely. There is a route by which yeah. people yeah. can yeah. come yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. another thing is, this is a very specific skin disease. And there's a whole thing in the text, a long bit in the in the Torah itself about all the ways that you can don't mistake this regular skin disease for that, right? And you really need a priest to get in there and dig around and figure out if it's this particular thing with the particular little white dot in the middle, because there's so many other skin diseases that are not this. You know, and um, and I would really, you know, I think it's really important. I, I you know, I'm going to read that at the moment as, and let's be certain not to, you know, to distinguish between ordinary skin problems and ordinary splotches on your house and on your clothes and so forth from this morally uh, potent version. But I, I am very glad that you brought that up because it's really important to distinguish. <laughs> and I wish you luck with your psoriasis. Excellent. Um, and, you know, I think acne, acne in teens is, has some of that same, I mean, it can be really devastating because it's so visible outwardly and it feels like it should be private you know so that boundary situation anyway thank you this is a this is actually helpful to me to hear these perspectives and now as i want to break the rules the first rule of planning a one hour study session is you talk about one thing and i want to um i want to actually talk about something else for the rest of the time. And that is the very first Midrash in Leviticus Rabbah on the, in the portion Tazria. Um, it's, it's an iconic Midrash. And it's weird because its placement here is seems completely random. This is a Midrash that was stolen from Genesis Rabbah. It's, and it's one of my favorites you know, really earth-shaking midrash from Genesis Rabbah, and it fits beautifully there. Um, it's a commentary on the splitting apart of the first human into a man and a woman, and it and it's hooked. I'll show you the verse that it's hooked onto in um, in Genesis Rabbah. It's really really interesting. And now, out of context, it seems to be given. Pride of Place, the very first Midrash on Tazria. And when you're doing a double portion on Tazria Metzora, um, it's a slightly abbreviated form of the version that's in uh, Leviticus Rabbah and its connection to our verse, the very first verse of, of, of Tazria is really oblique and that's how they do it they they hook it to the very first verse of, of of the section they're interested in so um i am going to show you oops yeah this doesn't work the way i'm used to um shoot wait how do i get to the next page oh no oh no oh no Just a second. I gotta find the. Maybe I just have to. Whatever. I'm gonna have to do it. I have to do it on this on this screen. 
I was able to do one page the way I like, but I'm now going to have to do this part this way. All right. Um, so you can see that now, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start by showing you this verse. Um, in, I mean, unfortunately, I can't see everybody anymore, which is, makes me very sad. Okay, so um, this verse in Genesis 1, verse 6, uh, no, it's not, it's, it's verse 26, sorry, that's a typo, verse 26, it says, by Yomer Elohim, na'ase adam b'tsalmenu kidmutenu, let us make a human in our image, according to our likeness. Well, what does that mean? In what way is the human like in the likeness of God? Well, so that's where it, that's where it's hooked on. Bob, do you have your hand up or is that an old hand up? Okay. Um, so now I'm going to show you where it's hooked on in 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 our portion in Leviticus Rabbah, here, the very first line, by Adaber Adonai El Moshe Lemor, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Daber El Bnei Israel Lemor, speak to the children of Israel saying, Isha, a woman, ki when Tazria, she signifies. Vyalda Zahar and gives birth to a male. And then it goes on to say how long she's got to stay uh, away from her husband and what kind of um, what kind of sacrifices she has to bring and blah, 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 blah. But that's the way it begins. And this word Tazria, it, it's so, you know, the word Zera, Zera is a seed. And this is a form of the noun seed, a made up verb from that word that means that's in the causative form. So causing seed, it, this form is only used in one other place in the Bible. And that is on day three. And then again, on day six, when, when, when God says, let the earth sprout sprouts. And he says, um, plants that mazria zera that seedify seeds right that cause seeds of seeds so this whenever you see that word it has this almost circular sense of seedifying and that's the line here a woman when she i said produces seed and bears a male but that you should know that's just a really really weird word um and so that's the verse that it's hooked onto in um, in uh, ignore it. we're ignoring that. Um, that's the verse that it's hooked onto in Leviticus Rabbah. Okay, put that aside. The way this midrash works is like the way so many other midrashim work. It um, it uh, starts from a verse in the writings, in this case in Psalms, and what, what's called a far verse or an intersecting verse, a verse that's far away, doesn't have anything to do with what's at hand. And then, and it's usually a somewhat hard to interpret kind of verse. And then it uses that to, um, it offers many different interpretations of that verse and eventually comes back to the verse at hand. So that's just how this Midrash is going to proceed. So here's the verse that it plays with. It's from Psalm 139, verse five. Achor vakadem sartani vatashet alai kapecha. So it's, a, you know, like most Psalms verses, it has two halves. The second half is kind of easy. You have placed your palm upon me. The first part is really hard. What does it mean? 
And you can tell it's hard because there's all these different translations out there. So Robert Alter says, from behind and in front, you shaped me. You have placed your palm upon me. New international version, you hem me in, you hem me in behind and before. King James, thou hast beset me behind and before. JPS, our standard these days, you hedge me before and behind. There's an Aramaic, uh, there's an English version of an Aramaic Bible that says, from the beginning to the end, you have formed me, which I think the rabbis may kind of understand that because they all know Aramaic. And I, th I want to say, I'm going to use this behind and before you have pressed me. So the thing is, behind and in front, are those behind and in front or are those before and after, right? What, is, what does that mean? And, and what is this word sartani? Some people say shaped. Some people say beset, hedge in, formed. And really, I think pressed is a is a kind of version. You press me from all directions. So press me like a stamp, pressing out something and forming it, or pressing as in being, you know, pressuring. Um, I don't know. So it's hard to read. So that's why they love this verse. Right, mold maybe. Um, Anyway, so he, I'm not. I'm going to skip this. This is just a bunch of different readings that help to inform all those different translations. Like we really don't know exactly what those words mean. Um, the after, back, behind, later, before, in front of, earlier, east, right? Kedem. It could be before, in front of. It could mean earlier. Or it could mean later, really, kind of where you're going or where you came from. It, right? Have you ever heard the phrase "kadima" onward? But what kedem is in the past. Um, so there's all these. I mean, so this is uh, this is. I'm just saying this is a real issue. What this means. All right. Now we're ready to look at the at the midrash itself. So. Um, anyway, if anybody wants to raise their hand, they should just talk or um, or use the hand raise thing because I can't actually see everybody. Okay, so let us just read this. It begins, Isha ki tazria zera, a woman when she produces seed. Hadahu dikhtiv, thus it is written. The, and that line from Psalms. And I'm going to read that behind and before you have pressed me, or maybe formed me, or maybe troubled me, you have placed your palm upon me. All right, so let's start with Rabbi Yochanan. Um, uh, um, Bob Barkin, you want to read that one? Uh, so, Rabbi Yochanan, if a human merits, he inherits two worlds this one and the arriving one. Thus it is written, behind or after, and before you have pressed, performed me. And if not, so it means, uh, uh, and if not, he comes to give justification and reckoning. As it is said, you have placed your palm upon me. As it is written in Job 13, 21, take your palm away from me. And that's actually not in the Genesis Rabba one. They're just like, in case you want to know, putting your palm on people can be problematic because we know that from Job. All right, so what is this about? How are they interpreting? How are they interpreting behind and before you have pressed me? I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't like, it's like protection, right? Okay, so if he merits, right? So what they're doing here, good, that's nice. So what they're doing here is they're saying the first part of the verse 
behind and before you have formed me, right? You have made me so that I have a backstory and a future story. I have this world and I have also the next world. And you've given me that and you've made me for that double life behind and before. And the other option is if I don't merit, you just smash me. You put your hand on me. So I think he's seeing, I think Rabbi Yochanan is seeing these two halves of the verse as alternatives for any given person. Okay, so I mean, really what I wanna emphasize here is that all of these are going to think about human life in terms of a kind of duality, that there's a two-ness to our existence. And so this first one is just laying that out there and saying, well, the two-ness or what we should get as two-ness is that yes, we're in this very, you know, difficult world that we live in. And there's also a realm of reality beyond that, that we have access to. That's what it means behind and before. I'm not sure which is which for this rabbi, he doesn't tell us, but that that there's a duality and there it's a duality of the basic realities, the two basic realities that we live in, the perfected era and the real era that we're in now. Okay, I'm gonna move on. The second piece, and this is actually the one that I care the most about, but um, <laughs> uh, Martha, you wanna read that? Where do you want me to start from? This Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman. Said Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman, at the time when the Holy Blessed One created the first human, he created it androgynous. Said Rish. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Have people heard that? It, right? So at the time, I mean, it's really an incredible thing to say. And by the way, if you can read Hebrew, look at that word. So it comes from the Greek. Androgynos. It, it not only comes from the Greek, it is the Greek. Oh. Androgynos, right? So he, at the, and so what I want to say, well, we can read this, we can read the rest of it because I think it's all part of the same idea. Okay. Said Reish Lakish, at the time that it was created, with two faces it was created, and he saw it, it and two backs were created, a he back saw for the male. With a saw, yeah. A back for the male and a back for the female. They challenged him, but it says he took one of the selahs, the ribs. One of the ribs, right? So his, they here being his colleagues. So Reish Lakish says, yeah, that when he created it, it was two faces, right? And you, you have to. In its context, this is about, I mean, remember, do you remember what verses comes off of in, in um, Genesis Rabbah? I mean, in Genesis? What's the, what's the verse that, it, that I showed you at the beginning? Let us make a human in our, our image. image, right? Okay. In our image. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Well, Reish Lakish is saying, and then it says, Zaharu Nekeva bara oto. I, he created it, male and female. That means God is androgynous. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just amazing that to put this, right? And then, and then his, then his, his Reish Lakish's uh, uh, colleagues challenge him. He says, but what do you mean he two backs or two faces and he cut it in half and it's now two backs. He, he, it says he took one of his sides. And what's the answer? 
I mean, uh, he took one of his ribs, is what it says. We all know that. He took one, Adam's rib. It's the name of a restaurant. Everybody knows it's Adam's rib. Why are you saying two faces? And the answer is, go ahead, Martha. He said to them, that means one of his sides, as it is written in Exodus, and for the Selah, side of the tabernacle. Right, so this is in Exodus 26, we're getting the, the detailed instructions for building the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And there's a place where it says, you should put this on each tzela, on the tzela of the tabernacle. It's not the rib, it's the side. So he says, it's the side, it's not the rib. So he, he answers that objection that his colleagues made. Okay, so that's a whole little mini midrash. And it's now talking about another form of, and I think we're, we'll just, we won't necessarily read the rest of these, although this next one is really fun too, but maybe we'll get there. But, um, but really what I want to ask is, like you just concluded that God is androgynous, that this in its context suggests that that when it says our image, and then, oh, it was androgynous. And what does our mean? Well, it means, how was it in God's image? It was in God's image in that it was male and female. Right? And yeah, I, I, a very effective, I mean, it's a very effective reading of the details of the text and the, and the problematic bits of that Genesis text. Go ahead, Martha, what were you saying? No, I have to say, I didn't just think of that. Um, I I studied for a little while um, an Orthodox woman who some people refer to as rabbi, living in Israel for many years, um, put her some of her classes online during the earlier part near, of the pandemic. Near, near David? Her name is uh, Sarah Yehudit Schneider. Oh, uh -huh. Yep, yep. Still small voice. No, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, that's, that is the, the, it's hard not to come to that conclusion. I mean, I agree with you about it, wherever you got it. Um, but reading this, it's hard not to, not to think that that's really what Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman and Reish Lakish are suggesting. Um, and it really, it's a, you know, it's the kind of reading of the text that it's hard not to say, huh, that really works when you read it. Yeah. So on that, on that theme, Rabbi, um, so when we learn later about, you know, I believe it's, you know, Adam and Eve being described as a, as a connecto, so, you know, so like, <laughs> challenging partners or however you would describe it right but this actually makes sense it's consistent with that i think where yeah. you know we're not talking about a hierarchy we're talking about peers that bring their own strengths yeah to a relationship and, and that includes constructive criticism or yes and my favorite experiences. yes and yeah. my favorite translation of that azer connecto is I don't know what about Azer, but the Kenegdo is corresponding to him. That's really what that means. The Neged means opposite and opposite, right? Um, and and corresponding, looking at, facing. Um, and that's that's I think. I mean, I think then you. This isn't directly from the text, but I think it's hard then not to read the creation of the world as God's doing that, right? The breaking apart into two so that God has a significant other corresponding to God. And the rest of the story is trying to make that, is God learning how to be in that relationship? Um, how, how is this um, reconciled with the, I guess the, the two different versions of the, creation story in which one seems to say god adam then eve and then the other is god human and then split um seem to be two different narratives in genesis that may um, have 
an author. Well, I think one thing that this is doing is is helping them is find is at least through one little wormhole uh, reconciling them because it's saying zahar unikeva bara otam in like in the first story. I mean, it doesn't solve the order problem, right? right? But it is saying. Well, in the first story, it seems like uh, immediately they're created male and female. And then in the second story, some people read it to mean, oh, the first one was a male, right? And the second one was um, was a female. But, in, you know, I think the most sort of direct reading, non-Midrashic reading, really, direct reading is that the first, is that, there really isn't any gender until after that split. I mean, these guys are saying there were two genders, and actually, in the there there are um, versions of this where it's no gender. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so before we have to end, I, I want to go back to the re to how this what this is hooked to, right? Isha, I'm going to go back to this version of it up here. Isha ki tazria ve yalda zahar. What are they thinking by taking this midrash and retrofitting it into this location? It works so beautifully in its native location and it seems it and by the time they wind down we're not going to follow all their their weavings but by the time they wind down to the end and try to bring it back to this it's really doesn't really connect that much the way they the way they try to make it and so my question is why would they want to include this and really give it pride of place as a way of meditating on the line Isha ki tazria ve yalda zahar. A woman when she seedifies and gives birth to a male. <laughs> I mean, I'm seeing this as I, I think that they are imagining this woman splitting in two, and now there's a male and a female, and and she is a creator. Remember, Eve is the first real creator. That story is the story of Eve saying Kitov, right? The very first real narrative in the Bible is about Eve becoming a creator. And this woman is a producer of seed who divides into a male and a female. And I think the rabbis are pondering that and just amazed at it, at the way human beings get born and, the, and at the possibility for um, for productivity in this, um, in, 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 and what childbirth really means and the kind of power it entails that you started out as one being and now you're two beings. And that is as miraculous as the splitting apart of that first human. And how the heck does it work? So I think it's a meditation on that to stick this midrash right here at the beginning of this portion. Isn't structure. that kind of the the um, other side? I mean, here Adam is a man, splits apart and creates a woman. Yes. Here you have a woman who's kind of splitting apart and creating a man. I mean, yes. it's interesting that they talk about the male. I, I think, you know, in the we're talking ancient mind. Yes. They didn't have a problem with a woman creating a woman. Maybe, maybe it was. And somehow this is 
a, a, the miracle is that a woman is creating a man. Well, it, I think that's part of it. I, I agree. And I think that, you know, that see, that is amazing. And then, you know, there's also, maybe it's not quite as amazing that she becomes two people if one of them is also, the other one is also a woman, but in, but in, Bo a baby woman, but in in both of the um, in, in for both they end up having to um, there there's a lot of uh, for when a woman gives birth to a male there's certain things that need to be done and to a female there's other things that need to be done which are slightly well. Yeah, so may, I think you're right. I think they're even more amazed that she can split apart and become something of a totally different gender. And That's not even shaped like her. A couple people with their hands up, just to let you know. So yeah. Martha and then yeah. Michael. Martha and then Michael. Know, Steve did earlier, but he may no longer have. The same. Oh. Okay. Martha and then Michael. So I want to I want to thank Bob because I was sort of going down that road too. This is for, but, but first of all, I want to say Adam wasn't a male, Adam was an androgen who split into male and female. Although in our imagination, and I'm sure in the rabbinic imagination, we're always thinking of Adam as a guy, as male. In this case, so there are many sociological reasons why a woman is exalted when she gives birth to a man, I mean a boy, a male. Here, there's this spiritual exaltation where, wow, look at, like, it, it's almost like she goes back to the original state being both male and female, because she's carried this male, and then splits, as, as Bob was saying. I, I, it's fascinating. At first, I thought it was like I was having this bizarre thought, but then Bob gave me courage to sort of pursue yeah. this further. Yeah. Absolutely, that's exactly where I where I was going. That 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 somehow the the idea of it being a a male that she gives birth to first of all makes it more like she was originally that androgen, and she's the original human she, at that moment in her phenomenology she mm -hmm. is the original human right and she breaks apart in the same way as the original human right and that mm -hmm. the fact that it's a boy gives it it's gives it uh you know raises up that that amazingness to them as the way i see it i think that's not on out of character of what you were saying I, yeah. yeah okay yeah. michael and then steve well, I, I came up with a very weird connection or thought. Uh, the phrase says that the woman produces seed, it says nothing about marriage or, and so on, and she gives birth to a male. Are we, this, and now take this back to the time of the rabbis. We talking about immaculate conception and a whole other woman had seed and provided a male in the whole beginning of Christianity, immaculate conception. You know, I don't know. They certainly had, there's a lot in these chapters, in this these couple of ch chapters, especially this, this chapter um, 16, is it, of um, Leviticus Rabbah. There's a lot about how fetuses work. And, and then there's a lot of other sort of legs to that in that happen in the Talmud um and they have some pretty wild ideas about that but they don't seem to think I haven't seen I thought you were going to go somewhere else and say Tazria is like producing seed and the Zera the seed is actually what's usually associated with the male I thought you were going to go there and say maybe they're saying she produces maleness um, I don't know, but I haven't seen anything in my travels through this stuff. That sounds to me like immaculate conception, but I will keep my eye out for it. It's an interesting question. And Steve. Well, for me, it, it I, I keep uh, coming back to the, the phrase with the plural, uh, the plural, uh, let us and our as being multiple gods, 
And mm -hmm. uh, of course that runs square into the first commandment of uh, God is one mm -hmm. uh, and the duality of that, of mm -hmm. that reading. Uh, I wonder if the rabbis uh, debated at all the thing of maybe there were multiple gods and, and then there's the unity happens or we mm -hmm. should look at it as a I, yeah and they don't they they entertain the idea but they don't they don't buy it right they never say oh yeah that's the thing there's multiple gods at that point what they do have all kinds of all kinds of theories about that but this particular theory is i think the way you know what martha started with which is this is an answer to what does that mean that god's multiplicity no it doesn't mean god that there's multiple gods they're actually making the argument here that what it means is god has internal multiplicity and if you think about it elohim is a plural word it makes so much sense it just makes so much sense and you know it's like we really need to use we really need a new pronoun here That's just the bottom line. Yeah, um, Bob, and then we're gonna say goodbye. Yeah, I just wanted to add that this um, has a flavor of, um, you know, the concept that the uh, a woman and her fetus are not two people and they don't become two people until birth. Right. Um, and yeah. I understand that's a different conception yeah some people have about yeah yeah no that's very interesting and certainly uh bears on the question i mean there's a lot of things uh in the in directly in the torah text that make it clear that they that actually uphold that vision that they're the same thing until the baby is born a Thank pleasure you. talking with you all you. and um and i'll see you in uh, may sounds great thank you so much thank you excellent bye okay thank you all